Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tools for the Creative Life. Um, I am Leah Podzimek, and I'm going to kick things off for us today. But before we get started, I just want to start by acknowledging that the land we are living, working, and creating on is the traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. We are intentionally recognizing the 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the great state of Colorado. We honor elders past, present, and future and all those who have stewarded this land throughout generations and recognize that the government, academic, and cultural institutions were founded upon and continue to enact exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. We also recognize that much of our nation was built by the hands and on the backs of enslaved Africans and indigenous peoples and stand in awe of their resilience and creativity and express gratitude for and celebrate their past and ongoing contributions. We strive to never take for granted the privilege and complexity of living, working and creating on this land and intentionally honor black indigenous and communities of color in our city and state. Welcome again for tools two tools of the creative life. Um, tools for the creative life is a workshop series aimed at providing creatives of all disciplines and backgrounds with connection, new skills, inspirational capital and tools to create a healthy creative ecosystem. The series is a partnership between five different community organizations and businesses based in the Denver area, each of which is dedicated to helping artists and creatives thrive and impact our society for the better. I am here today representing Transforming Creatives, which is a nonprofit organization operating in Denver that invests in the health of creatives through professional and personal development resources. Today's event is just one of the ways that we serve the amazing creatives in our community. We also operate a creative workspace in the Rhino Arts District called Converge. This space is home to filmmakers, photographers, visual artists, designers, nonprofits, musicians, and other creative humans. We also provide one-on-one -on -one mentorship, business resources, and just launched a new program called Creative Assembly, an interview series that brings artists together for shared learning, mutual support, and experiences in community. We also provide micro grants through an emergency fund and our Artists of Color Fund, moving financial resources into communities of color, one artist at a time. We love to work with fantastic partners, one of whom is the Denver Public Library, who I'm going to hand it off to Jen Dewey to introduce. Thank you, Leah. We are thrilled to be one of the partners doing Tools for the Creative Life. We appreciate working with you all so much. Thank you all for choosing to be here today with us. Like Leah said, my name is Jen. I'm with Denver Public Library. And today I wanna let you know that all 26 of our locations are open as of last Sunday. Even part of the downtown central library is now open. They're doing tons of renovations down there, but please come visit us at any of those places. Um, we have all the things that you would expect to find in a library, but I also wanted to give you a heads up that we have a ton more. We've got online business resources, one-on-one -on -one tech help appointments. We've got maker spaces with Adobe Creative Suite. We've got historical photo collections online just so much stuff as you explore the uh, digital realm and make artwork. So please visit us at denverlibrary.org to learn a little bit more about that. And I believe I am going to turn it over to Meredith with CBCA. Thanks everyone. Awesome. Hi everyone. Hope folks are doing well. I'm Meredith Badler. I'm the deputy director at the CBCA, which is the Colorado Business Committee for the Arts. Uh, we are also a nonprofit and our mission is about connecting arts with business and business with arts, uh, all with a focus on advancing our creative economy and strengthening our communities. Uh, we, um, like many of our partners here, offer a lot of resources, webinars, trainings, events uh, for creatives uh, all over the state. We run Colorado Attorneys for the Arts, a legal referral service, um, and just are over the moon to be part of this partnership and very excited for today's conversation. Um, so I'll kick it to another one of our partners, uh, Allie Sharp with the Rhino Art District. 
Thanks, Meredith. Hi, everyone. All right, I'm going to keep it short. Uh, I always end up last, so I don't want to ramble on, but welcome, everyone. Um, Rhino Art District, as I'm sure you know, is a state certified creative district in North Denver. And like everyone else here, we are very ecstatic to be a partner on this series. And we've just loved how it's evolved. Um, we have a fantastic panel lined up for you today. Um, this is just one of our um, many programs that we put on. We're also working with the Denver Public Library on a youth art workshop series. So if you have kids, we will be back in the art park starting next month in August um, and have lots more exciting things going on. So uh, with that, I will kick it to our last partner here today, Steph with Creative Integration Initiative, and she will be introducing our moderator as well. So we'll get started here soon. Hello, I'm Steph with Creative Integration Initiative, which is a organization here in Denver that provides um, education, workshops, curation and uh, of the visual arts and is just very excited to be a part of this collaboration. I, it's my pleasure to introduce Lali Mehran, who is the, uh, excuse me, a professor, an artist and program director at the Emergent Digital Practices Department at the University of Denver, Colorado. So without further ado, let's begin our panel today. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for um, sharing your afternoon with us. And I wanna give a big shout out to um, the sponsoring organizations and all the organizers and the many emails that we exchanged to make this happen. Um, and this uh, fantastic, I would say, a series of panels. Um, we're going to obviously, for the sake of time, not be able to um, talk about everything, although we might want to. Uh, so please note that if we're missing something, it's not because we don't think it's important. It's just uh, for the sake of time and also for the sake of our um, expertise on the panel. I do want to note that although um, we are in many ways celebrating technology, um, that it's not the answer to everything and to recognize that there is built in bias uh, in technologies, particularly um, for BIPOC communities. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with um, just sharing a few things really quickly and then kick it off to our amazing uh, panelists. Um, today we have David Moak, who is Director of Programming at the Denver Theater District. We also have Annie Phillips, who's founder of IRL Art and uh, director and curator um, in her own right, and also has made a fantastic Google Doc with many resources, which we will share um, in a bit as well. Um, we also have Nathan Schneider, who's an author and professor of media studies at CU Boulder. So um, I shall uh, start. I shall just try again. <laughs> too too many windows and uh, having some situation here. All right. Um. So. Uh, I just want to um, basically uh, just go through um, some some variations of um, what this can look like. Uh, so starting off with uh, interactivity for um, environmental awareness. Um, this is a really uh, fantastic project um, by uh, a team called IO. Um, and um, uh, they really bring incredible amounts of uh, simple, um, seemingly simple interactivity um, to uh, um, kids. And um, I, apo I apologize to artists as I will be scrubbing through all these for the sake of time. But you can see that they're using uh, pillows as log to divert um, oceans and waters. And that basically starts a whole nother ecosystem. And it's an incredible way to uh, have really complex conversations um, with uh, younger populations. Uh, another project here um, is by Justin Gitlin. Um, this is an enormous uh, feat of technology um, where clearly it is uh, not only a, a collaborative um, uh, group of cinematographers and technologists, but they're all working together to bring together 
uh, this um, uh, one of a kind um, in, in real life, massive space where all of this can uh, connect. And so this is um, pretty high level commercial feat um, that I would say many of us would be thrilled to be part of. Um, and it's certainly a different range of uh, approach and techniques um, and entry. Uh, this next piece um, is by Carla Guinness, and it is uh, actually um, taking Hieronymus Bosch's uh, paintings of 500 years ago and changing everything with emojis. Um, and uh, it, it speaks to how our environment is uh, changing um, and permanently and what that is going to look like um, in, in the real and obviously taking uh, an approach where there is criticality um, in these playful emojis, um, using them digitally, but there's clearly some uh, darkness to it as well. Uh, this next piece is uh, all about um, incredible feats of empathy um, with Alejandro Iñárritu. Um, and this piece, I don't know if anybody had a chance to see it. It was uh, around Denver during the pandemic. It's an incredible VR piece that has to do with um, true stories of um, uh, uh, immigrants and what they experience. And uh, it's cinematic and motion capture. And it, it's really incredibly moving and an incredibly complex piece. And uh, again, for the sake of time, I am scrubbing through this. So I apologize to, to all of those creatives. Um, this next piece is uh, quite a bit of a spectacle by Team Lab in Japan. Um, it's an uh, incredible amount of um, projectors, 400 uh, plus computers um, to make this uh, um, massive uh, 10,000 cubic meter space um, come to life. Uh, and again, it, it speaks to the possibilities of it. And these are uh, clearly on the larger scale and scope. Um, I think it's important to, to think about innovation when it comes to digital technologies. And Natrice um, Gaskin has this amazing generative art, art piece, which is uh, basically deep dream generator and machine learning. Um, uh, she has a show coming up at the Smithsonian. These are extraordinary pieces. Uh, and again, amazing possibilities for us all to think about as, as, it, as our field shifts so quickly. So thinking about um, what all these uh, areas can mean and how they come together, um, just putting together uh, the, the various um, arrays of uh, basically uh, economic systems, methods of support, impacts, goals, um, and uh, talking about some of the ecosystems that are available and uh, also keeping in mind that not um, one size fits all. And so this is a perfect kind of space and place where you can carve out a niche for yourself and to keep that in mind. So if, if uh, the things that we show you today across the board are not you, um, this is an opportunity for you to make space. And um, one of uh, my personal goals, and I, I believe shared by many, is how do we make Denver a hub for digital creativity? And um, I believe that in this, it's going to require uh, leadership in healthy ecosystems and uh, that are brought to you through inclusive and diverse perspectives. Uh, this is how this can happen. Um, and this is how I believe that Denver will have its collective sustainability and longevity. Um, and although this is quite aspirational and requires a great amount of work, I do also believe uh, that it is quite possible. So um, with that, a uh, very uh, quick <laughs> shot at, at some multi-million dollar projects, um, I'd love to <laughs> hand it over to our incredible panelists so you can also get a breadth of, of what they all do. Um, uh, should, should we go uh, in alphabetical order? Um, would that be cool? Awesome, so I hand it over to David. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is David Moak. I, uh, as mentioned earlier, I'm the Director of Programming for Denver Theater District. I also do a few other things. Let me just throw this up too. Well, won't, same as uh, Lale, I'll probably kind of go through them. So we are an interesting nonprofit based out of downtown Denver. 
we get all of our funding from the LED screens and billboards. So we get 15% of the money that goes into the ads you see. I then spend on cultural programming, art installations, and other stuff. So particularly in the kind of digital arts world, a few things I wanted to show off. Um, I am the director of Nightlights Denver, which some of you might've seen on the DNF clock tower downtown. I commission artworks every month, uh, new artworks to present as part of a give or take 10 to 15 minute program on a loop. I also do community-based programming, like stuff with schools and everything else. This is uh, Justin Gitlin and Debbie Clapper, uh, Debbie Clapper, also known as Neural, I believe, um, their art project. But we do cool projection mapping around downtown. Um, I was kind of brought in as a last minute replacement um, for this. Let me figure out how to go back with this. Hold on, I haven't used this in a while. There we go. Uh, so um, Sharifa Moore was actually originally scheduled to be on this panel, and she's part of a group called Denver to Girati. Uh, they throw an event along with my nonprofit every year called Supernova, where we take digital animation and throw it on all of our LED screens downtown. Um, you know, we're going to talk a lot of different ways to take your art and bring it into the digital world. Um, projection and LED based are two obviously very large, large format and you know large money uh, opportunities out there. Um, but the other thing too is even if you do something that's a bit more human scale than an LED, there are still options out there. So um, for example, uh, I have an art gallery space called Understudy at the convention center, and we've hosted a number of creative technology uh, installations as well. So um, the one on the top left is just a POG store, no creative tech at all, but I like POG, so I wanna throw it in there. But as you can see on the right-hand side, top right, that was basically an optical illusion uh, kind of AR, VR thing that um, an artist, Michael Sperandeo, did about a year ago. Um, and so, you know, we have this big unused space, but we ended up shrinking it down. So really you only looked at it through part of a window, but it was a way to take his digital art and make it into a physically responsive um, in-person experience. Um, you can also just take, you know, your art, like you see on the bottom left-hand corner and just blow it up really big, like Robert Seidel out of uh, Germany did a few years ago with us, um, you know, in the space. And even, you know, on the bottom right there, you have Kendra Fleischman and her daughter who did a project where she does digital art, but then did it in such a way where she makes this uh, cathedral type vibe of it all. And so it's taking their, her digital art and bringing it again into the, the real world, which I know Annie Phillips will talk a lot about. Um, two other little things. Uh, video gaming, I know, is a big element in creative coding within this world. Realize that this is definitely a very new world that's growing in fun ways. Um, on the left there is... Bear Warp, a local group who make their own kind of art video games, and they're also unique controllers. I would say if this is more a world that you're interested in, um, there is a lot of opportunity there. And as kind of the public starts to understand what more art video games are, I think you'll see ways to then showcase those in the public uh, sphere. And then on the right hand side is just a little projection that I'm currently doing right now at the Billions. Um, you know, you're going to see projection take off over the next few years in ways that I don't think any of us anticipated happening this quickly. Um, but if you do any type of work that can be projected, we'll talk about this more as we go on, there'll be a lot of opportunities out there. So that's it for me. Wonderful. Thank you, David. And Annie, if you can. Sure. So let me get my screen shared. And what I'm going to do is show, I didn't do a presentation, um, so I'm just going to walk you through our virtual spaces of a few of our previous shows that we've done. So one of the things that we've been incubating over here at IRL Art is the idea of being able to pay every artist that participates in our galleries, as well as doing 0% commission, a choose your own commission, or donating it. And so we've been just trying to find ways to bring that vision to life. And we've had a lot of success with putting in proposals to various um, social token communities or decentralized autonomous organizations, also known as DAOs. And um, basically what that is, is communities that have a bank account of cryptocurrency that's decided upon how it's going to be used by votes from the community that other community members put in proposals. And so this project was called Black Love Art and Crypto and was curated by my business partner, Rob the Art Museum. And um, we were able to onboard and work with over 50 black artists from around the world. 
this was in the pandemic. So it was really special to be able to still produce a show and to be able to really rethink like boundaries and um, physical limitations of uh, producing art shows. So, um, you know, we didn't have to ship any work. Uh, we didn't have to pay rent uh, and things like this. And we still had a really successful time where all the artists were paid to participate as well as their art was available for sale as NFTs. And so there's two gallery spaces in for this project um, and it's in crypto voxels, which is kind of like a Minecraft world. If anyone's ever built in Minecraft, it's very similar and uh, the builder tools are all in game and um, everything other than buying the parcels are free. But I also in my resource doc I put together laid out how to essentially um, be able to build free spaces as well. So here's these spaces and they're both two stories and anybody can access them from a phone, tablet or computer. And then I thought I would show y'all our more recent gallery that we did that's actually a recreation of our real physical space. And um, the idea is just really trying to bridge physical and digital as much as possible. And we um, basically hosted a fundraiser auction where we gathered up all of our historical assets of fan and community art of our different mascots for a um, hackathon that's here in Denver that um, is the world's largest um, hackathon or build-a-thon and um, people come from all over the world to basically participate in winning different prizes to um, solve some really crucial uh, problems using technology, uh, blockchain technology specifically. And so anyway, we launched our own community uh, DAO and did this auction fundraiser and uh, basically, this is our physical space in Denver. Um, and the designer that I've been working with is Yule Tech, and he actually grew up playing Minecraft and was really excited to basically uh, jump in on these more uh, formal projects where he could use skills that he never really thought there would be much practical application for. And um, now he's really working uh, towards what that would look like in the future of really, um, you know, using this as a way to create digital maquettes of real work, uh, real designs and installation artwork, et cetera. And so, um, yeah, so this was our more recent project, but we released a token and the main point of that was to really capture the um, spirit of participation of all of the people over the last five years of the conference. And so everyone who's participated, spoke at, been a steward, been an artist, all got rewarded and now are voting members so that they can both put in proposals as well as vote on proposals of what the future of that community looks like. And it's called SporkDAO. Here's like a cool little thing that we actually stenciled and put on the wall. So it's a uh, very realistic. It's kind of strange when you're in there. We actually have like a VR headset that is synced up um, like room size. So you can be in the physical space in VR and it's like you take the he headset off and on and yeah, it's cool. Um, and then I wanted to just briefly talk about like our mo um, a show we actually haven't announced yet. So giving y'all a little um exciting look at something to come so we have two shows that we're about to announce one in august and one in september that um, are both funded by cryptocurrency and this one i'm really excited about it's part in partnership with the museum of crypto art and basically over the last uh five years they've collected 160 uh, works of historical crypto art in an attempt to really preserve the history and the truth of what's uh, the innovators in the space. And so I will be, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, on the side if it's cut off, but um, I will be curating within that permanent collection of artists for artists to revisit their work um, that is in the permanent collection and create AR overlays. And um, 
I'm just really excited about it. We're going to be activating it in the physical space and we're going to be expanding um, an, into a new virtual world called Somnium Space, which we haven't had an opportunity to build with, but this was a really cool way to gain access to Somnium Space that oftentimes the parcels again are really expensive. Um, they, the museum is granting us both a space to build in and um, their token to be able to uh, reward everyone who participates. So that's kind of what we've been doing. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. And, and uh, yeah, so much to dig into. Thank you, Annie. Nathan, uh, lo love to hear uh, all of the incredible things that you're working on. Great, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, and it's great to see these these spaces um, uh, uh, come to life. Um, so I come at this really not from the perspective of the art world. I'm a professor of media studies uh, at CU Boulder, but I found myself uh, in this coming fall, starting this summer, uh, helping to organize a artist residency called Excavations, Governance, Archaeology for the Future of the Internet. And I thought I would take a few minutes to just explain why I'm doing this and why, uh, to me, the opportunity to work with artists um, feels so necessary uh, and so important. Um, I could start in a lot of places, but one is just like for, for many years now, I've been really interested in um, kind of alternative technology practices in using community-based technologies wherever I can, um, in you know, from like running open source software on my computer to joining communities uh, that uh, share server resources and things like that. And over and over, uh, I've been uh, forced to recognize the way in which this is not something that one can do alone. That that built using technology kind of consciously, awarely, uh, you know, with, with a, an awareness of how it affects the economic and social flows around us is, is not something that we should consider doing alone, that we need to build infrastructure for communities for and, and also economies for. Um, and so over a, a number of years now, I've been uh, involved in building uh, this movement known as platform cooperativism. This is an attempt to take the things that a lot of us love about technology and uh, you know, the ability to connect with people, the ability to find new ways of working and creating, um, but to put it under the ownership and governance of the people who, who are users, who are workers, who are really putting the value in, recognizing as you know, so many of us do that we have deep problems of accountability um, deep problems of, of wealth inequality, you know, that might be captured so powerfully by Jeff Bezos's expression of gratitude to the workers and consumers of Amazon as he steps out of his rocket yesterday. Um, just a reminder of how, you know, uh, deeply screwed up uh, the the economies and the and the accountability of the current online economy are. So the platform cooperativism is an effort. Um, all, all over the world to try to build these kind of cooperative startups. And uh, lo and behold, as I got started in doing this, I, I, I had to realize pretty quickly that the people who were already doing it, who were already leading the way were, were artists communities. Um, one example of this is Stocksy United, which is a, a stock photo platform, which I really encourage you to, to use if you have the need for stock photos um, that is owned and governed by by the artists who who produce the photo and video content that's for sale there, they you know determine the terms of their uh, of how they sell work and it um, and, and they've been successful in attracting some of the best artists in the business uh, in order to do that work. A more recent example is Ampled, which is kind of a Patreon for musicians, but much more um, a platform upon which to build. Um, communities of musicians uh, working together um, and, uh, and, and building on the, the reality of so many communities of fans uh, who feel like they are co-owners, like they are true stakeholders in their relationship with the artists they love um, and actually reflect that in the business model rather than leverage that 
feeling of ownership um, in an extractive business model. Um, so, so here you recognize that in order to build tools that reflect our social realities, you know, we need to you know, build technologies that reflect those realities. We also need to think organizationally and financially. What are the underpinnings of these so that you know, in the end, we don't just wake up one day and realize that, you know, that Jeff Bezos is, is taking all of our, all of our creativity and, and community and using it to, to, to um, peace out into space. Um, a really incredible um, uh, example of this legacy of artists thinking about the economy and building economies um, is a recent report um, that you can find at, at the URL art.coop. Um, and it's, it's a, a really comprehensive introduction to the idea of the solidarity economy, old ideas, um, and how to bring them into the contemporary uh, art economy. And in some of, some, some of this involves challenging some of the boundaries that we think of in terms of who is an artist. They talk in the report a lot about culture holders, you know, recognizing that in many communities, people who hold culture and who, who pass on culture and who advance culture are not you know, given the designation of artist per se. They don't have the kind of institutional confirmation that we might expect from, uh, uh, from artists um, in other contexts. And so it's a really beautiful approach. And once again, a reminder from um, communities of artists uh, of how to um, build uh, more equitable um, economies and technologies on top of that. And, um, you know, this has also been a dimension in, um, in, in, in another side of work I've been doing uh, in, in the last few years, which is this idea of exit to community. Uh, this is a framework and a, and a growing network of startups that are looking to, um, to turn toward community ownership. And, um, and to find pathways toward community ownership. And again, one of the things that I've, I've recognized in the course of doing this work, you know, on the one hand, there are technological solutions we've been exploring, including you know, crypto technologies uh, uh, like, we've been, like we've been hearing about already. Um, and, and all that stuff is really wonderful. But part of it too um, is the, 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 just the challenge of storytelling. Um, what kinds of stories, what kinds of mythologies, what kinds of imaginary uh, do we have uh, for, for even dreaming about what the startups, what the companies, what the organizations that we actually want are and how we get there. So Exit to Community is, a, is, is an effort to uh, bring together the kind of financial and legal and, uh, and, and technological resources we need to enable startups to be community owned more easily, but it also really is, is a feat of imagination. Um, and, and so then after working with all these, um, uh, these different kinds of projects, I've recognized over and over that the technologies we have uh, for building communities online are often really, really poor for self-governance, for enabling people to have real power in meaningful ways in direct fashion. And, um, uh, it, you know, this really came to, uh, uh, became clear to me as I was doing some organizing and hearing my mother talk about her garden club and recognizing how much more sophisticated the governance of that garden club was than any online community I had ever been in. Um, and it was practicing very old stuff, very old traditions of human self-governance. Uh, and, and it just made me realize how far we have to go and how much more of a kind of stretching of the imagination we need to do to have the kinds of tools we need to truly practice self-governance, to practice collective power online uh, so we don't need the, the Jeff Bezoses of, of the world. So as we enter into this, um, this, this residency, um, we're bringing together artists and social scientists. This is a, a, a database that the social science side of the project is building of historical governance practices from around the world um, that we're going to put into conversation with artists who are coming to us with ideas about uh, challenges they want to take on in the online economy, in, in internet governance. And we're going to bring the results to 
um, uh, an internet governance forum that the UN is running in Poland uh, in December. But it is really um, born of the recognition that we have, um, you know, we have to bridge some real um, uh, 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 chasms of imagination in order to uh, realize our potential as um, self-governing people in this online economy and that and and to ensure that again the Bezoses of the world are no longer so necessary um, and so grateful to be part of this conversation um, and I'm really looking forward to um, uh, hopefully in a few months being able to share some of the amazing things that the the artists in this cohort uh, are going to be um, are going to be sharing thanks that was incredible and it, it gives me hope, um, which, which is hard to come by. So thank you for, uh, yeah, your, your uh, incredible uh, efforts on, um, uh, on all our behalves. Um, I have so many questions um, uh, and maybe uh, I can uh, just ask uh, a couple and, and make sure that um, the folks who uh, are, are, sh are sharing their time with us can also uh, ask questions. Um, uh, we we had an opportunity um, uh, to connect uh, previous to um, going on this public panel, and um, I would uh, love to have a conversation just really briefly. So it's a question for Annie, um, and it had to do with um, uh, you know many of us have diverse practices, and I think some of the things that are more complicated and have not. A, conventionally lent themselves to um, being able to disseminate the work and or um, uh, basically have any kind of financial uh, uh, means from it have shifted. And so um, Annie, uh, could you please share that, that amazing uh, story of uh, your performance and how it kind of shifted to NFT and, and how, it, how they had a, uh, I would say an odd symbiotic relationship, but, but really did work out quite well. Sure. So I've been a digital artist since 2008 and just playing with a lot of open sourced um, software and teaching myself. Um, I didn't study uh, art traditionally uh, as an undergrad. I was still kind of discouraged that, you know, of the, the starving artist trope. And basically, um, I, I do a lot of visuals, so I um, worked a lot with dancers and performers. I've worked with like Lucent Dossier and Lunar Fire and some really incredible like large scale productions where I work um, to project on the dancers, on LED screens, um, projection map stages and things like this. And it was my work was always meant to be really ephemeral and I never wanted to necessarily commodify it. I'm also a burner. I go to Burning Man and I think that I've always wanted to um, have my art remain very ephemeral and not commodified. There's always just been this like tension there. And so uh, for me, when I was asked to curate for East Denver in 2019, I basically um, started researching NFTs and the potential with all of them and started minting my own work because I had probably over 50 finished works that I had never made prints of, I had never sold, I just used for visuals and various things. And um, basically I, you know, was really drawn to the fact of keeping my digital art in its uh, native state. So as digital work, I think a lot of people might relate to this if you're a digital artist that as soon as you like hit that render button and the work feels kind of dead, you know, you, you aren't able to move it around and interact with it still. And so it just felt like at least a little bit closer to it still feeling like it was um, maintained in its original state. And um, for me, just the, the royalties are a big aspect. Um, I've, so I've been minting work for several years now and um, you know, pretty regularly I get passive income through the royalties of the secondary sales of my artwork. Um, but one of the big things that we were really exploring with one of the uh, shows that we did in April and May uh, called Motion was, it was really meant to be more installation driven artwork presented as NFTs. And that's where I really wanna keep exploring, especially in like the entertainment industry, 
um, to keep pushing more viability for artists to capture the value of their work in these non-traditional settings. So if you're a VJ or an installation artist that does a really incredible projection map piece, oftentimes you get a flat rate, but there's there's never historically been a way beyond that to really capture that value. And I think that NFTs can really play a big role in that as a way to create more ways for people to support you, to also document your work um, in great ways. So it, with Mo Motion, we had um, projection mapped frames by a local projection map um, collective called Waveform. We had um, a large uh, vintage retro TV installation displaying NFTs from a collective called Chaos and uh, DSDI did a big um, uh, large scale projection piece and then make ideas move. And then as well as a projection mapped mural by AL Grime and Waveform. So we had a lot of like multimedia installation driven work, but the idea was not only do you get paid for participating, you can sell your work and maintain royalties passively for forever. So just really trying to unpack that and leverage it so that we can make um, these engagements more sustainable. Thank you for sharing all that. I think it's really uh, complicated, particularly uh, if you're not doing additions or if you're not doing a traditional um, work that's valued uh, in those kinds of ways uh, in um, either, you know, high art and to, to understand that that there is um, interest in that and certainly value and how to, um, I, I love the kind of cascading and the scalability and the scale systems that you have in place and, and talking about, um, you know, uh, if, if one is in a place to uh, donate uh, the kind of earnings of, of an event or something versus uh, no, that's not where you are right now, you know. So, so, so having that opportunity to kind of make decisions and also to have the work valued at perpetuity um, is, I think, something really extraordinary. And, and um, thank you again for sharing this. One of my favorite things of, of this story from Annie, I've heard it twice now, and I love it. Is is the idea of this ephemerality um, in a lot of ways of of what. Uh, digitality is and how we can kind of push it forward to um, kind of uh, live longer, not necessarily archival, but to kind of uh, in a way that reaches more folks. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting for to have all these opportunities. Thank you. Um, David, if I may ask you, um, you and I talk about this, uh, you know, we, we talked about it, I think, on a, on a couple occasions now. Um, and, uh, and one thing is, um, I, I really deeply appreciate your enormous efforts of bringing um, particularly digital art opportunities to Denver. Um, as a digital artist and someone who makes videos, um, it's just something I, I hadn't really thought was going to be um, a possibility uh, for me outside of uh, kind of uh, the conventional galleries and museums. And can you please talk about um, how if folks who are interested who are either makers or non-makers but really love this kind of creative space, how can they help facilitate this kind of um, expansion of bringing uh, all of these uh, really uh, incredible digital um, experiences uh, to a city or, or to Denver particularly? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of different ways. I mean, when you think about it, it's, you know, if you're a creative right now making art that isn't necessarily in the digital world, how can you make it digital in some way? Um, you know, when I'm doing the projection mapping of the clock tower, you have the fancy projection mapped digital animations, but I also do partnerships with like the Center for Fine Art Photography based out of Fort Collins, you know, doing photography or uh, uh, I mean, one photography here in Denver being another example. Um, it's kind of that idea of right now, the biggest goal in my world is to get more people understanding of what exactly it is. Um, and I mean that in the, the physical infrastructure, as well as like what even the file types and stuff are, um, what constitutes digital art or creative tech or creative coding. Um, and so when I view programs like the clock tower one that's in the middle of a public space, my whole goal, and I view this as more entertainment than it is art, is to get people to understand what this stuff is in a context outside of massive entertainment spectacle at the Super Bowl or at a, a massive, you know, global dance fest size arena tour. Um, you know, it's kind of sitting there and saying this will become more commonplace. So for those of you out there doing uh, 
content, the first thing is figure out how you can take your art and put it into certain types of things, whether it's going on the NFT path and some of the stuff that Annie was talking about, or even is your art good for projection? Realize that not all the art is good for every level of this kind of creative tech digital world. You know, if you're a, a painter doing, you know, canvas based work, I can throw that artwork on the clock tower. But unless you add a little bit of motion, you know, you're probably missing out on some of the opportunity there. People also with projection even forget like, I can't project the color black. Black is the absence of light. So you start to really think about, okay, you know, what works and what doesn't work. Now on the flip side, those of you that might be more in an administrative role or in a hosting role, right now the biggest thing is, you know, a lot of this work is obviously done on, on and via screens. So if you have a screen or the ability to host something, particularly let's say you're a, you've got a restaurant or your lobby has um, televisions in it that are currently showing CNN or Weather Channel or Golf Channel. Have you considered utilizing that time to show off digital art? You know, can we basically expose more audiences, more mainstream audiences to this type of content? And remember that we're not necessarily talking about going super deep, fine art that you have to understand how it's made to really appreciate. It's more, how do we just have it in a way that allows people to enjoy it, right? To want to see more, to want to engage with it. Um, the other thing I can say is, when it comes to fostering your internal talent. If you have a marketing department with a graph designer, that graph designer is also an artist. So how can you start giving your staff and employees opportunities to go and become artists on their own right with things that aren't necessarily done as a, a commission by your client, You know, something that they totally have full control over. And so figuring out how you can give opportunities to that and groups like myself are very interested in supporting that. You know, The clock tower in particular, night lights, I, my goal is to say yes to people when they approach me wanting to show art up there. And really it comes down to, can we physically do it? And does your art look good up there enough to wanna you know, host this for the public? Um, for example, portraits don't work so well in the clock tower because it's really easy to lose an eye. And then when you lose an eye, it ruins the portrait. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a lot of things in your, your question there to unpack, but I think the biggest thing that I try to take away and something I hope you all get is Right now, a lot of this might be going over your head, particularly some of the stuff that Annie talks about. I worked with ETH Denver before too, and I still barely understand the whole crypto, you know, Ethereum blockchain and how all that ties back on some of the ownership side. But on the flip side, there is something out there that you can understand, you can participate in. And at this point, it's just showing that we can all do it. Um, yeah, the, the you can't project black tends to be something a lot of people have to get used to because when you think about like filming or photographing something at that golden hour of light, that's the worst time to film content for projection because everything then kind of disappears. Um, and remember that I have 10 projectors that are each 21,000 lumens on the side of that clock tower. So it's 210,000 lumens alone, which makes it probably the brightest uh, thing outside of Vegas um, between Mississippi River and, and you know, LA, so, um, or Vegas, but uh, yeah, there's a lot there to unpack. All I can say is keep supporting it and keep supporting the people that you think want to, you know, get involved in this world because the more people that are in it, whether it's video game, motion graphic design, or really fancy 3D sculptural NFT models, let's just see more of it. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> thank you. And, and I think, um, yeah, there, there's some uh, mystery and slippage happening with um, uh, uh, much of the digital uh, kind of uh, new things that have popped up. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to direct everyone to Annie because that, that wouldn't be fair, um, but <laughs> you, can look, you can look it up. Um, and if you're interested in participating in that, uh, you can yeah, uh, maybe contact a few of us. Um, so I, I love the ideas that you shared, David. Like, the, the kind of opportunities, right? Like you've got screens just sitting there. You've already invested in that technology. Why not have something uh, that's going to be um, a, a little more eye-catchy, right? And, and they've, you know, research shows that as uh, biological creatures, we actually uh, do respond to movement, um, right? It, it's kind of uh, what's kept us alive for, for a long time. Uh, so, so having that kind of change of something that is more interesting or unique, that is more uh, art rather than uh, maybe the kind of typical things that, that they see like uh, sports that you expect to see maybe um, does really have, have that opportunity. And I also love the take advantage of your own employees, <laughs> like give them commissions to, to make, you know, art. Cause if they are artists, like uh, talk about a morale boost, um, 
you know, uh, I think I think that would be like uh, really great um, uh, for that. So, uh, so yeah, uh, thank you. And, and I would say, uh, David, if I may, I, I would <laughs> tell tell folks who are participating, uh, he's incredibly generous. Um, please reach out to him if you have ideas of of how and where to show work. Um, uh, David has 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 really uh, opened up so many opportunities for us um, uh, across uh, so many um, venues that you wouldn't have considered uh, to be uh, incredible um, uh, showcase places. Uh, so definitely an amazing ally in that regard. Um, and uh, Nathan, I have a question for you. And, and like, I actually have like a bazillion questions and I'm trying to like figure out how to focus this um, into something that, that might be a little more local. And my question is, um, do you know of efforts in Denver uh, for alternative co-ops uh, for, for artists um, or like how to govern kind of digital companies that are um, more Denver based? Yeah, thank you. Um, we're, we're actually uh, uh, in the state of Colorado and in Denver in the lead nationally. There's, it's really exciting. Um, our governor uh, started his campaign for the role in an employee-owned grocery store in, in Colorado Springs. And since then, he's set up the only state-level commission in the country to advance employee ownership. Uh, of businesses. And so we have organizations in, in Denver, for instance, like um, the, um, uh, the Rocky Mountain Employee Ownership Center uh, that helps groups form employee-owned businesses, uh, or the Center for Community Wealth Building, an amazing organization works particularly in low-income communities. Um, and then for housing, there are communities like the Queen City Cooperative, which has kind of become an anchor for sprouting new housing cooperatives uh, around the city. And it's very, you know, there are a lot of artists in there um, and uh, a lot of artist leadership there. Uh, and, and also outside of Denver, organizations like the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union um, do a lot of uh, co-op development work. We also have some of the most creative, flexible um, co-op laws in the country. So we have, um, uh, uh, actually, I think Ampled, which I mentioned earlier, is incorporated here. And a lot of, um, and it's based in New York, a lot of uh, uh, co-ops around the country that are trying to do more creative strategies for shared ownership are doing it in Colorado because we have um, our farmers a few decades ago had the foresight to, to introduce real laws that enable a lot of flexibility and imagination. Um, so we're we're really in a great spot to um, uh, to lead the way on this and to and to continue developing a much more uh, cooperative economy. Um, and and we got to recognize too that um, as that art .coop, um, uh, report really emphasizes that things like you know cooperative and community land trust housing is a part of the art economy. Um, commercial spaces are part of the art economy how we um, manage the infrastructure of our society changes the, the, um, the, the calculation of who is able to be an artist. So, you know, that, I, I love how that report really begins with the question of art grant making and ends up kind of pre presenting a, um, a vision for society as a whole, um, recognizing that artists are, you know, potentially any of us. Um, and that it's it's the economies around us that you know determine what we can and can't do. But um, you know, I'd love to help connect anybody into the cooperative economy in our community. It's really a, a vibrant uh, place to be, and and um, you know we're we're lucky. That's amazing. I th I think um, something that uh, it's it's hard to kind of consider. Like we, I think you know many of us become like uh, so kind of um, micro focused and myopic. It, and, and to think like, well, no, this is not about art, but actually to have um, viable uh, housing, right? Or to have space, right? And, and I'm thinking of, of some of the tragedies actually in San Francisco with the fire and right uh, a few years ago with um, basically co-ops uh, not entirely um, legally um, uh, maintained by artists, right? Because that's like all they could afford um, and, and how that kind of led to, to, to so much loss. Um, I think it'd be fantastic to, to have this more explicitly, I think, uh, laid out for um, many of us who are not in your field or not economists or not kind of thinking in these ways or just honestly like so exhausted from 
having multiple jobs that you can't really focus on understanding like, well, I want to be creative. So help me understand how, right, this kind of uh, governance is going to, to lead to that. Um, I, I think like those, those that kind of flow uh, would be really, um, I think, helpful for for, for a lot of folks. Um, I'm, I'm putting myself in, <laughs> in that line. Um, I think that'd be amazing. Um, and uh, so, so again, uh, thank you so much for, for all your uh, enormous uh, efforts. And I'm so proud of Colorado. I didn't realize that we were uh, leading the way in this. So I, I feel really uh, great about that. So I think that's another shirt we need along with uh, you can't project black. So um, uh, before um, we, we jump to the questions. Um, I just put uh, the Google Doc that um, Annie put together. Um, again, has a lot of resources. So um, please uh, take a look at that. And I'm sure that'll be uh, helpful. And the rest of us are adding info in there as well. So I think at this point, we um, would love to hear from you. Um, so uh, please um, submit questions. Um, uh, we can unmute you. I don't know if there's the hand raising <laughs> option or whatever is the best. Uh, take advantage of having the, these amazing panelists um, ask questions, and I'd be also happy to, to respond. Annie, your doc, I just want to say, is incredible, so we'll wait and see if anyone has any questions. Is there any specific section or place you think we should start um, in that document that, you know, would be the most beneficial to, you know, a, a very wide community here? Yeah, I mean, for me, a big focus of my research over these last like set, like the last seven months has been a really condensed research period because in February I was granted through Unique One, which is a nonprofit that does grants for high impact creative projects and through their native cryptocurrency rare. And so one of my big focuses was um, understanding passive earning and UBI. And um, so there's some really good resources in that because I think that once we can create more um, just like underlying stability, we can start really figuring out uh, what we really want to focus on and what we want to do. And um, again, with the tension of like commodifying and selling work, like being able to kind of alleviate some of that a bit and really produce art that speaks to us as artists. And so I did put into like, there's a lot out there um, I put in Bright ID, which is um, an app that's really good for all these different ways to earn cri cryptocurrencies. But um, the two that I highlighted, Emirate and Proof of Humanity, are the um, most substantial ones I found that I thought. Um, so I've I've tried to filter a lot of um, other ones out there and really just include stuff that I think is worth checking out. It's, it's an incredible resource. It's quite comprehensive. And I, I would say, like, I know, again, like, it, this is quite daunting for, for many of us. I would just, like, start slow um, and and reach out if, if those are directions you want to go. And I think one thing that hopefully is, is um, pretty obvious is there's so many options with uh, creative practices. Um, and, you know, if you uh, think that NFTs are, are, are not where you want to go, there's so many other options for you to um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, sh showcase who you are and what you what you believe in and you're interested in. And if you don't see it, uh, I just want to go back to what I said earlier, like create that niche for yourself because we, we will love it and we need it. And uh, the more I think Denver has unique opportunities for creative uh, output and outlook the better it'll be for everyone. There's a question, Annie. Sure. So how do you advertise your NFTs is the question. And for me, I started minting my work on a platform called Super Rare, which I kind of distinguished in the resource stock, the platforms that are open. And what that means is you don't have to submit an application process to be approved to mint on the platforms. I've more recently gone in this direction, and um, but I do recommend for artists that have a more built out uh, portfolio of their work to try and get on the more exclusive platforms because they have a very well built in audience of collectors. And um, I think towards the bottom of the doc, people were starting to build out people to follow on Twitter. So um, unfortunately for me, I've never had a big presence on Twitter. Um, whereas 
that's the main hub for a lot of the NFT and blockchain community. And so certainly try to take that serious and, you know, put some effort into establishing a presence on Twitter. And um, I go around and just follow all of the people who work for the platforms that curate um, and just try to start building and like, you know, just commenting on people's uh, post and engaging so that it is organic and you're just, you know, a lot of the space is built on participation and so it's just um, trying to build a real community. Um, Discord and Telegram are great platforms as well for joining different communities of the platforms. They almost all have their own Telegrams and Discords. Um, I know Unique Ones is substantial. There's over 10,000 members in there. so. It's a really great way once you've minted an NFT to then post it in the um, the Telegram and Discord groups as well. Yeah, the the, the more the more popular you are, it, it certainly helps. Um, and yeah, making eye catching work. Any other questions? Um, how about this? Um, what are what would you say to keep an eye out for in the next a few months? Like what what's next that we should be all looking out for, um, whether it's uh, Denver specific or um, regional or global? Andy shared some 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 pre exciting uh, information with us, so that was really great. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to say a couple things to keep an eye out for. Um, so obviously Nightlights being the first permanent um, major projection mapping installation here in Denver, but you'll start seeing more of those come online here over the next year or so. Um, we have one on the side of the Sheridan Hotel that will again, um, I call these people's projector, they're open opportunities. I commission artwork um, from anyone who can make content that does lend itself well to these. So be aware that not just stuff I'm doing, but other groups, you will see more opportunities for outdoor projection, as well as other LED based creative tech art. Um, and then generally, I've been very impressed with where the hologram technology has been going. Um, Portal is an interesting group that, you know, is, is doing basically Pepper's ghost level stuff that could be there. So um, I think that's an interesting new world as we see where, you know, AR and VR go. Now this hologram is getting a little bit more, you know, you could have it anywhere. So I think those are interesting. Um, and then I think, uh, yeah, you know, we'll see as the continued Pokemon goes and those things in the world, but those do, you know, for augmented reality and some other stuff. Um, the Botanic Gardens will be hosting a very interesting augmented reality art exhibition starting in September that is in partnership with 12 other botanical gardens from around the world, I believe led by Jerusalem's Botanical Gardens. And as far as I'm aware, it's the first like massive, you know, Ai Weiwei level art um, AR exhibition at an institution here in Denver. So if that goes well, it really it doesn't even matter how it goes, right? We're gonna learn and see how the public engages with this type of stuff, particularly at a space like botanical gardens where, you know, are you all gonna wanna hold your phone as you walk around the gardens? And so I think, you know, it's very interesting to see where this could go, but keep an eye on stuff like that because whether it's that or even immersive Van Gogh, you know, these are things that we really haven't seen before um, in Denver to this scale. And I think depending on how that adoption goes, there's either opportunity for you all or ways to pivot and kind of, you know, figure out what's better for the, the Denverites. Yeah, that's great. Nathan. Um, well, one thing that is already happening that I just want to highlight too, that, you know, uh, Annie met, mentioned earlier, ETH Denver, um, and, uh, and, and, with that token release, they're actually um, uh, uh, piloting a new approach of folding um, cryptocurrency stuff inside of old-fashioned legal cooperatives. So the legal structure behind that is a is actually a, a Colorado cooperative. Um, and so this idea of bringing together the old and the new is another thing that we're really pioneering here in Colorado, and and uh, it's it's really exciting to see that happen. Um, one other piece, if, if anybody's interested in this, in these questions around online governance, we're really in a moment of renaissance, partly because of that crypto stuff, like because people are building networks without a company that's running it, um, they're having to figure out 
in ways that we really haven't had to before, how to manage resources. And so there's a lot of really creative innovation in, in the um, self-governance online happening right now. And, and you know, what I think we really lack in many contexts is like a kind of visual and experiential imagination for how we do that. And that's, that's just a call to anybody who's, who, who is interested in these questions. Um, and, um, and if people are interested in, in getting involved in these discussions, I'm, I'm uh, kind of a co-convener of a network called the Meta Governance Project. It's an international network of researchers and practitioners and, and um, all sorts of people interested in online governance. And I'll, I'll put the, the URL in the, in the notes, but we have a weekly seminar that anyone's welcome to join um, uh, where we just hear from somebody who's doing something awesome in, in, in online governance and love to have you involved. We also have a, out of my lab, a, a new book a little booklet uh, uh, on based on our platform community rule. Um, that's just a handbook for for starting, you know, for setting up basic governance in new communities. So I'll, I'll share that as well. That's fantastic. It, this also makes me think, you know, in part like thinking of um, uh, in ways of sharing and community, the open source community, uh, and many of them, uh, you know, with software and hardware, do have governance and code of conduct, and they take it really seriously. And it really does make for different kinds of communities, right? Like it's clear the ones that, uh, you know, particular folks gravitate towards and feel, you know, included and they become really, um, uh, frankly, healthy and they grow. And it all has to do with um, how, how the governance of, of, or there is governance, <laughs> there, there's recognition that, that there should be some kind of dialogue about that it is part of the open source uh, uh, tool. So. Those are really fantastic. Any anything that you'd like to additionally share? Sure. Yeah. So in addition to the exhibits that we'll have in August and September at our gallery at 2611 Walnut Street in Denver, uh, we also still have the Black Love Mural Festival activated that was partially funded through cryptocurrency um, in the Civic Center in between the city and state capitol building where we were able to pay um, a, about 60 uh, black artists to paint murals. And um, we're gonna be turning a lot of those into NFTs and as well as documenting it uh, virtually so that it can have um, an ability to be um, preserved. And then also we have a two floor exhibit currently at the McNichols building that was in partnership with Major League Baseball. And we, we're able to curate, I think, about 70 artists that are a part of that. Um, the second floor is called Black Love Mural Festival Remix, and um, those are all works from Black Love artists. And then on the third floor is a larger cross-cultural collaboration um, with four mural artists and their studio work on display. And that's up till October 3rd. Amazing. Again, there's so much to see, and I, I really appreciate the breadth of, of the kind of experiences and um, uh, ways of, of engaging. So I, I think it covers, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to say all of it because, you know, I don't want to be uh, definitive about things, but it, it does really cover uh, so much and, you know, hopefully many points of interest as well. Um, there was a question about um, uh, audio and musicians. Um, so uh, it was, it, it has been answered a little bit. Um, so uh, just going back to um, um, if there are any other uh, musicians here and, uh, but what cool things they have seen performance musicians do uh, to have their work into a digital space. Um, and, and another person who uh, is, I'm gonna ask both the questions, who, who teaches uh, digital um, classes uh, for kids and they wanna know any resources for teaching them about NFTs. So the musician uh, question uh, was up first. Any, any uh, thoughts on that? Any suggestions? I have a couple and then I'll let Annie go because I know she can also tell about the NFTs. Um, I wanna give a big shout out to the Big Gigantic crew and I forget the name of the guys that were doing their uh, live 3D visuals, but that is truly one of the most incredible things I have ever seen live. 
Um, it is still glasses based 3D when I custom built screen, but basically they're able to take the live feed to the concert. So when the trombone player is playing, that is actually a 3D effect. And I'm sure some of you have seen Flying Lotus or even Kraftwerk do a 3D engagement. This blew those out of the water because in my opinion, this understood this is more about that negative depth and adding to it rather than in your face, let's you know make this a, a PG movie at an IMAX theater. So um, I think some of that's very cool. Additionally, I just want to say that from what I'm hearing in the events world, you know, hybrid events aren't going away, uh, particularly for things like fundraisers, because the additional work that it's taking to make it somewhat virtual ends up being worth it at the end of the day for the overall event. So I'm thinking like, you know, if you're doing stuff, obviously you were excited to get back and do performances to the public and everything else. But if there are ways you can kind of make that world, you know, intertwined, um, I can't speak too much on it, but I've seen some ideas get thrown at me that are very much utilizing a lot of the technologies we've talked about all day, but in that live setting as well, um, potentially as a choose your own adventure type of story or being able to change backgrounds, utilizing digital art as opposed to the traditional you know, theatrical scenery. So I would say there's a lot of innovation happening. Um, and the last thing is we'll see if it happens, but I have heard that Tipper in early August is attempting to projection map all the trees at Red Rocks. Like they think they can do the individual leaves We'll see if that happens. It could be one of the coolest things in the world or just literally impossible. Um, I just wanted to shout out audius.co. They're a really great alternative streaming platform where artists uh, way more, or musicians specifically get uh, rewarded much more fairly than you know SoundCloud or Spotify. And they have a grants application that's live right now where you can get up to, a, I think, 2,500 of their token. And it's all listed in the resource doc, but they're really cool, great community. A couple uh, others, one um, for both live and virtual um, events is called Group Muse. It focuses on traditional forms of music and it recently became employee owned and is in the process of becoming um, artist owned, musician owned as well. Um, they're, they're based on the East Coast, um, but they're, they're um, uh, also working with some of us in Colorado. And then also Resonate, which also has Colorado roots is, a, is an artist owned streaming platform. Uh, that has had some ups and downs over the years, but it has an active community and is worth checking out. I, I listen to it a lot, really, really good stuff on it. There's also um, some recent concerts I've seen. It was uh, Machine Drum and Ryoshi Sakamoto have um, these really crazy, like um, uh, it was like augmented and collaborative uh, with artists, multi cameras, just um, really, I think honestly, it's like it's more um, of a uh, real experience than being there. I mean, other than maybe the, the quality of audio not being as great, um, just because you're you're having this insight that you would never really see, like you're not really normally allowed on stage, and you can't have all these like um, uh, meta experiences. So I think a lot of this does actually break. Um, the, the fourth wall and, and go into really interesting depth that, that can be uh, explored and I would say by musicians for sure. Annie, do you know any cool uh, resources for teaching kids about NFTs or did we start going to Pandora's box there? Yes, there is. We recently just um, funded um, an elementary school to learn about NFTs through the Blockchain Foundation. It was a school in Harlem and um, they're, they're called the Blockchain Foundation. Um, I'm not sure if they have good like online videos, but they did provide um, uh, instructors who came out and did a really fun workshop with the children. Um, and so I think there's all sorts of options. If um, somebody wanted to just reach out, I'd be happy to kind of brainstorm what that could look like. Uh, we have a question about um, what young artists are, um, uh, oh, uh, like basically uh, graduating and walking into, into this region and what they, they can look forward to. So as they graduate uh, high school, what can they expect 
uh, to be walking into as they uh, want to go into a creative field. Um, I can go first real quick, two things. One, I think it comes into, are you a creative or do you just like to be around creatives? So I have no artistic talent. I know people always say, oh, you can do this. Truly, I do not. I can't color in the lines. So what I recommend is there's also opportunities out there to work on the administrative side, to be a facilitator, an arts advocate, particularly in this new creative tech, digital art world, you know, eventually we're going to need people with specialized skills, everything from, you know, it could be as, as straightforward as content management to, you know, people that just have a lot of knowledge on how holograms work, right? So there's also kind of thinking, do I want to necessarily be a creative or be around them and work, you know, in multiple fields? Um, I will also say, you know, internships and stuff like that, while still maybe relatively limited, because a lot of the creative tech fields tend to be kind of new. And, you know, these are startups and in groups that might not have the capacity to provide a great internship. There are organizations like the Blockchain Foundation that Annie mentioned that do have more programs in place and for lack of a better term, tracks that I think might be good resources for people that are just stepping into this world and are looking for a little bit more um, educational guidance or mentorship. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I think, you know, just having an understanding that this is a pretty robust field and, and there is no kind of one hat. And in fact, there's many hats. And so which hat do you want to wear? And, and you can change your hat, right? So you can start as, a, as one thing and, and go into another and having that excitement of being around it, whether you are the one making it or facilitating it or doing both or starting a whole new space is really exciting. Uh, Annie or Nathan, any other uh, thoughts on kind of uh, emerging uh, creatives, whether through I, out of high school or undergrad? Or honestly, like doesn't have to be a formal academic space, but just anyone who wants to kind of be is new to this space. I think the Westward does a really good job of listing events. Um, when I first moved to Denver, I used their event calendar quite a bit just to find cool ways uh, to experience art. They often do like a weekly or monthly article about free things to do. And so that's a really great way just to like get out and like see what feels good and what resonates with like what you're wanting to do and just to find some good community. Yeah, and if anybody is interested in studying with us at C Boulder, um, I would love, you know, I'm very interested in working with anybody who's who's uh, interested in, in building more equitable media economies. I mean, at the undergrad level or master's or even PhD. Those are great levels of entry from... Uh, I, I really also do appreciate how Westward has has the free sections, right? Like sometimes because you don't necessarily have the, the means or you want to try out things before you kind of commit. So I think that's really fantastic. And, and we do have an uh, amazing uh, grouping of, of universities here. Um, uh, yeah, and, and to do a shameless plug as well, we have the Emergent Digital Practices Program, which is uh, art plus tech plus culture. So um, both making and theory uh, for undergrad and grad as well. And so, and, and there's uh, also um, the Denver program. And so there, there's just a lot of them. Mines has, I'm not sure where their arts is, but they definitely have like a pretty amazing technology programs there as well. David? Um, I was just going to say, you know, there's a lot to be said about in this creative tech digital art space about connecting and networking, um, things like the Denver Creative Tech Meetup, which uh, Chris Coleman, who I saw his name pop up in chat, is involved with as well. Um, you know, I think there's some stuff out there. We're at such an interesting place right now. Annie's got, I'm sure, some amazing stories about artists she's worked with who ended up becoming super famous and big, and she gave them some early opportunities. And really, a lot of that is just the right place, the right time. And knowing that Denver has such a great uh, community of people in tech, um, I commissioned an artist out of Argentina to do a piece in the clock tower back March of 2020. And uh, months later, she emailed me saying, hey, I've had a lot of sales of my art, digital art in Denver. You know, you think there's any collaboration there? And really, it turned out probably not. But most likely, Denver just has a vibrant mark of people who want to invest and buy this art. So I would just say it still sounds weird, but like show up, network a bit, but network in these very specific niche realms based on whether you love the NFT crypto world or video games or just creative coding. 
That's great, uh, David. And thank you for bringing up the uh, Denver Creative Tech Meetup is uh, ha has relaunched um, and uh, just had their first meetup. And what was great was there were actually uh, a lot of musicians in that group. So folks who are uh, here with us today who are interested, um, possibly connect. And they were talking about everything from uh, um, yeah, making their own amazing uh, graphics to instruments to, uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was quite the range and really inspirational. Um, so uh, connecting with, with the folks that are going to take you to the next step and, and taking risks. And obviously, I would say um, clearly the, the panelists are all uh, extremely approachable and really, really nice. <laughs> um, uh, and I also open myself up to that as well. And so please reach out if you have questions or you want to participate in something because it's exciting to, to build our community um, here in the region and to expand on that as well.